Hello, welcome back to Authors on iTours. This is Lauren Carr, and today we are interviewing C.S. McDonald, the author of the Fiona Quinn Mysteries. Today we're going to be talking about her new release, Matrimony, Mayhem, and Murder, and we're going to be talking about the Fiona Quinn Mysteries, which is set in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If this is your first time visiting with us, then do be sure to give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button so that you will get notifications with our upcut with any of our new podcast interviews. Uh, we have quite a few that are coming up on the schedule. And so without any further ado, let's get started. For 26 years, C.S. McDonald's life whirled around a song and a dance. Classically trained at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater School, the Pittsburgh Dance Alloy, and many others, she became a professional dancer and choreographer. During that time, she choreographed many musicals and an opera for the Pittsburgh South Yards. In 2011, Cindy retired from her dance career to write. Under her real name, Cindy McDonald, she writes murder suspense and romantic suspense novels. In 2014, she added the pen name C.S. McDonald to write children's books for her grandchildren. In 2016, she added the Fiona Quinn Mysteries to that expansion. She decided to write the cozy mystery series that everyone, including teens and tweens, can read and enjoy. Presently, the Fiona Quinn Mysteries nine books with a tenth slated to for 2021. The books are also available on audio, narrated by Marin Swesson Waxenberg. Cindy's newest venture is the Owl's Nest Mysteries. Once again, she has set her cozy mystery in Pittsburgh. The female protagonist, Alexa Owl, is much different from Fiona Quinn. The Owl's Nest Mysteries has a little grit, a little time travel, a little romance, and a whole lot of cozy. Ms. McDonald resides on her thoroughbred farm known as Fly by Night Stables near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with her husband, Bill, and her poorly behaved Cocker Spaniel, Alistair. You are, so C.S. McDonald, do you mind if people call you Cindy? Just call me Cindy, that's Cindy. my name. Cindy, and you are starting on tour with uh, I Read Book Tours on January 10th with a matrimony mayhem and murder and that is your latest fiona quinn mystery oh that's, that's a right there it is there it this is, is. The back with fiona all dressed up like a little bride oh yeah, i well, like the little logo on the back that uh my cover person does for me my coven cover designer does we you always see a fiona on the back and she always dresses her appropriate the story so it's mm -hmm. it's pretty nice i like it uh-huh oh well well tell us um tell and uh, now tell us without any spoilers right tell us about the plot for matrimony mayhem and murder and which number book is this this was fiona number 10 installment of the fiona quinn mysteries and mm -hmm. <laughs> i am considering this a pivotal book in the series i i wrote this in such a manner that um to give the book, um, the series, shall we say, a little bit of a boost to change it around a little bit. You know, that I think when you write series, things can get a little dull for the reader. I try very hard not to do that, but you know, hey, it's, you know, the same characters and whatnot. My, I think my plots are much different each time. Um, hey, I wanted to give it a little bit of a space lift, if you will. Um, for the last 10 books, uh, that's not true, nine books. Uh, Fiona has not met Nathan's mother, and he mentions his mother all the time in all the books she's, she's mentioned. My mother says this, my mother did that. And Fiona says, well, when am I going to meet your mother? And he always says, oh, do you want to meet her? Well, yeah, I want to meet her. Okay, well, when she gets back from Austria or Canada or China or wherever Rita Landry is. So she's never had an opportunity to meet Le Re Rita Landry. And, and we, now, I find now she doesn't live there in Pittsburgh, right? All your books take place around Pittsburgh. They all take she place. She doesn't live there. Yeah. No, she doesn't live there. And, and the big question is, does this woman really exist? 
you know, mm-hmm. why, you know, we, we never can meet her. She's never around, you know, does this woman really exist? Well, now Fiona and Nathan are getting married. Now, mm-hmm. the thing about Nathan and Fiona getting married uh, in book 10 in Matrimony, Mayhem, and Murder is the fact that they are already married. Uh, mm-hmm. They get married in book number eight, Bon Voyage to Murder. And that's when they go on the big cruise, Caribbean cruise. And um, of course, there's a murder. And um, during the course of the cruise, Nathan just decides it's time. And they get married on the cruise line. And Mm -hmm. they decide not to tell anybody that they've gotten married because she wants, she knows her mother will want to put on a big wedding and she knows her father will want to walk her down the aisle. So in book nine, uh, Take Notes to Murder, he... They're married, they're living together on Oxford Street, but the parents are none the wiser. Mm-hmm. So now in book 10, they're putting on the big, the big event. Uh-huh. And of course, you know, with it being Fiona and, and uh, it, it's, it's not going to go as smooth as most people's weddings go. There's and that's of- one of the things that people love about Fiona is things just don't nothing ever just goes as they should you know the poor yeah. girl she's just always caught up in something <laughs> and um but, this but she's not a ditz but she's not a ditz that's why oh, i love no that. fiona is absolutely not a ditz in any way shape or form it's just that things that happen around her she gets caught up in them and um you know it just and, it, and it's always a murder of course but their murder mystery and um in this particular instance um poor fiona is mere days away from her wedding Mm -hmm. they're expecting rita landry to come into town Mm -hmm. poor fiona has to go and meet rita landry at the airport all by herself which she is not happy about Mm -hmm. and but nathan's working a big case and he says look i just can't go and so she's not happy about having to go by herself, but she does. Mm-hmm. And of course, when she meets Rita, Rita is this just beautiful older woman who is extremely well dressed and very well spoken, of course, well traveled. Yes. And um, as they leave the airport, they are being followed by two, you know, mysterious men. Mm-hmm. And then we go on with the parents coming to town, Fiona's parents, Nancy and Garrett Quinn, who of course live in Daytona, Florida. Yes. And they're all having a big dinner together. And Chad shows up with his girlfriend, who happens to also be Fiona's um, wedding planner. And her name is Kirsten. Yeah, I think it's Kirsten Young, I believe. And... Um, well, don't you know, poor Kirsten Young ends up being murdered in, in, in the whole story. And so the story revolves around the, the uh, wedding planner being murdered. And we find out certain things during that time. And these two mysterious men are chasing down uh, Rita. And she's forced to flee the country. And guess who gets dragged along? Poor Fiona. <laughs> Poor Fiona gets dragged along to England. And um, because, you know, uh, uh, Rita's wearing this absolutely gorgeous necklace that belongs to the Queen. So they have to return this necklace to the Queen. So, uh, and these two mysterious men are trying to get the necklace as well. So, like I said, she's drugged to England. And not only does the mystery become who killed the wedding planner, but can they get the necklace back to the queen and get back to the United States in time for the big day. So, in time for the big day. <laughs> and that's the mayhem. And of course, we meet characters along the way. Um, they're, I think, are pretty funny. They're, you know, we always have a good time. 
You always have a now, good time she had, because um, you know, starting with your first book with her was Murder on Point, mm-hmm. and and you didn't mention Fiona is a kindergarten teacher. She's not a great. She's not the. She's she's not a, a police detective. She's nope. not a. She she's is, not even an amateur sleuth. She's, she's not, just a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Every time something happens, she gets drugged by her hair into these murder mysteries. And now that she's going, was going steady and engaged, and of course now married to uh, Detective Nathan Landry, who in fact is a homicide detective, she's really drugged into them far more than even before. So uh, yeah, she's just a kindergarten teacher, and a lot of times I will fe- I will feature what goes on in her kindergarten class which is always an ordeal you know (laughs) where Fiona always says things to her mother like teaching kindergarten during the Christmas holidays is like storming the beaches at Normandy Um, (laughs) uh, at one point she said to her teaching kindergarten at the end of the school year is a lot like Custer's last stand, you know? So that's, <laughs> that's how she, she describes it. And a lot of times when I take you into her kindergarten class, you know, indeed, it's, it's kind of like that. <laughs> well, no, but, but, you know, she is, she, she's a sweet character. And, and as a matter of fact, because your first does. books that you wrote before you started the Fiona Quinn Mysteries, you've also written Romantic Suspense mm-hmm. and you know, where they're you know, a little bit more gritty than this. Why don't you tell readers how you came about writing a cozy mystery? Well, I was writing murder suspense and romantic suspense. And the romantic suspense books that I was writing was called the First Four series, which was a military black ops suspense mm-hmm. series, romance, romantic suspense with operatives, you know, and they were always, you know, handsome and whatnot. And those books were pretty hard hitting and there was a lot of content in them. They were not erotica books. I don't write erotica, but they did have some adult content. And, um, you know, people loved those books. Yeah. Loved them. And I only wrote five when I was writing children's books for my grandchildren. I wrote the George the Pony books for my grandchildren because they were just little and um, one day my granddaughter, Kirsten, came to me and she was about, I don't know, eight or nine. And she said, she calls me, they call me Bebop. She said, Bebop, I really like George, but I'm a little too old for George. So when am I going to be able to read one of those books? And she pointed to a first force book. Just happened to be six pack my, apps on the cover, and yeah, <laughs> with you know Stuart Reardon on the front, and he's all you know twenty two pack or whatever they are. I mean, he you know, and his shirt's open, and I'm like, ooh, ah, I don't think you're going to be able to read that till uh, maybe thirty two when you're thirty two. <laughs> and and then I thought to myself, what a dumb answer. You know, I've been writing for years, surely surely I can write something that literally anybody can read, starting with a 10-year-old. So I, if you remember, you and I are personal friends. We're good friends. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you kept saying to me, Cindy, you ought to write a mystery. You ought to write a mystery. And I'm thinking, oh, I, I don't think I can do this. I can't do it, Lauren. I can't do it. <laughs> so I, I decided, okay, I'm going to give this world. I'm going to write one of these cozy mysteries. Mm-hmm. And, and I said to you, do you remember? No one's going to buy it. No one's going to like it. And you also said, if this book sells, I'm going to blow my brains out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one's going to even look at this book. Well, that the goal just- was to be really sweet. That something that your preteen can wear, can read. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I wanted the book to be something that a 10, 110 year old person can read. You know, there's, there's no sex, there's no bad language, there's, you know, there's a good solid story to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I decided to 
base Fiona on a friend of mine. Her name is Debbie. And when Debbie gets in a bad situation, she gets verbal diarrhea. You know, and she just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks. And you're just kind of like, okay, you, you know, you're talking and you can't shut up. You, you really need, you know. <laughs> And this is who Fiona is, you know, the worse the situation gets, the more the verbal diarrhea becomes. And um, the book took off, Murder on Point. And I, I, we had a wonderful um, cover for that book, just a fabulous yeah. cover on that book. And people just loved it. And it just boom, 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 sold. And I thought, well, okay, I'll try a second one. So that's when I wrote Mur Mary Murder. It was a Christmas one. Again, really wonderful cover. The book sold like crazy. You know what? That book even sells in the summertime. Murder, Mary Murder. It sells all year long. And, and I just kept going. And here I am. Book 10. <laughs> and and you okay, well, well, let's talk about matrimony, mayhem, and murder. Okay. I thought, you know, so let, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, how has Fiona changed since that first book? Because now you're on book 10. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we've had conversations about this before, usually, especially with the cozy mysteries, mm -hmm. you know, and a series, you kind of want your character to be the same throughout, but, you, but just nowadays you can't, you can't ignore that. They, they grow, especially their experiences. So how has Fiona changed between the first book and the 10th. Fiona in the, you know, she was, like I said, we're very naive woman. Uh, and uh, she, as time has gone on, she's done a lot of growing up, my Fiona has. And if, in this book, you're going to see her assert herself. Mm -hmm. She's not going to be pushed around by Le Rita Landry. Not that Rita Landry is a nasty person. I, I didn't want that in my book. I didn't want there to be that nasty mother-in-law. But when you go to the airport and you pick up a woman you've never met and she's absolutely beautiful and she's so well-dressed, you know, and well-spoken and well-traveled, you're going to be a you're, little intimidated by her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and then she's got on this fabulous diamond necklace and you're like, where, where did she get that? You know, when Fiona gets herself in trouble with these two mysterious men, she's in the car with Fiona and she wants Fiona to do this and she wants Fiona to do that. And there's all these things going on. And finally, they manage to hide from these two men for a few minutes. Then she says, Fiona, you have to take me to the airport. And she's refusing to tell Fiona anything. And Fiona just says, nope, that's not happening. I'm not moving this car. Will you tell me what's going on? And you see her assert herself where well, you've never yeah. seen that before. She, she wouldn't have done that in the book, in the first book. No. But she did she solve a murder in the first book, though. Pardon me? She did solve a murder in the first book. but She, she, solves, she solves a murder in every book. book. But, you but. know, you, she never gets darn right not doing that you know but like she does in this book and mm -hmm. um there's some other things in this book that she does that are totally not fiona like and, and i think the readers will look back and go well good for you fiona quinn because i know when i was writing it i was i was like well good for you fiona quinn it's time you upped your back you know yeah, but then she wasn't she, you know, she, she's sweet and she's naive, especially in the first book, but she's not a, uh, she's not a pushover. No, she's not. She's a never been a pushover. Man. Yeah. Right. She's not a welcome man. It's, it's just that she's a little bit more um, confident now. And there's been like in waves of murder, you saw that confidence starting to emerge when Nathan sent her home from the lake because he was worried she was going to get into the middle of a bad situation and she got halfway home and she thought no no I, i'm going back there because you know for the reason that i sent her back you know mm -hmm. you started to see her 
asserting herself a little more. And uh, in Mambo and Murder, the um, outburst that she and had have at the ballroom dancing competition. <laughs> you know, and but her brother shows up. <laughs> right, you know, and she had no idea that he knew how to be a ballroom dancer. And they're trying to solve this murder from 40 years ago about three ballroom dancers. And you know, the whole thing blows up in both of their faces at the ballroom dancing competition. And I, I think it's, it's, you know, she's starting to assert herself, you know, where Chad's always been able to get the better of Fiona. And in this book, Fiona gets the better of Chad. So at the dinner table, you know, Fiona, yeah. Chad, Chad was always one to think of a really embarrassing story to tell about Fiona at the dinner table that just would, you know, she would be so embarrassed by it. This time, Fiona turns the table on Chad. Mm -hmm. It's entertaining, you know. Yeah, that entertaining brother and sister uh, situation. And as a matter of fact, and I'm trying not to give spoilers, there's a scene where Chad actually sees Fiona in Chad. I mean, where Nathan she sees Fiona in, in Chad whenever Chad gets himself into trouble a little bit with the verbal diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And he's saying just... Just shut up. <laughs> yeah, you're just, oh my God, you're just like Fiona. And, and Chad's very insulted by being said, told you're just like Fiona, yeah. you know, yeah. but um, he, um, and Chad, Chad's very ornery. That's, I love writing Chad because he's very, very ornery. And uh, he, uh, he's, he's just excellent at getting under his sister's sin, skin. So we don't have, perfect family situation you know they're not perfect like the Brady Bunch yeah ones, you know and um you know I they're even not dysfunctional either no they're not dysfunctional they're just it's normal bickering it's normal you know but it, it becomes a little bit more than that in these books because let's face it they're murder books so mm -hmm. you know it goes a little bit beyond that in this and you have to make it entertaining as well. But, um, you know, in, in Home Alone, the original Home Alone book, the story has a saying in it, a, a, a piece of dialogue in it that I think is spot on, one of the most truest dialogues you'll ever hear in any, mer in any movie. And that's when uh, Kevin is sitting in the church on Christmas Eve with that old man. I can't remember what the old man's name is. And uh, they're talking about family. And uh, the old man says, how you feel about your family is a complicated thing. And for me, that is the most honest line ever spoken in a movie. It really is. Because mm -hmm. everybody experiences it. Everybody experiences it. So that's that's what I try to bring across with <laughs> Fiona and Pat. We also meet um, Nathan's sister in this book. Yeah, his older yeah. sister yeah. Michelle. We also meet who, who's kind of supposed to be kind of like a female Chad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or or well, actually, he he's kind of. When his sister Michelle's around, he kind of becomes Chad. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, so we, we yeah, meet. Because there was one of the books where he said that he used to do the same things to his sister that, because he is younger than his sister. Right. He's younger than yes. his sister. And he said it's almost like a, a boy's, a brother's birthright to, to do that to their sister, to embarrass their sister. You know, it's like, it's like our birthright, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it makes that sibling rivalry real, you know, because yeah. we've, all, we've all been there, unless you're an only child, we've all been there, you know, and uh, it's, it, it, I tried to make it in, enjoyable, but believable at the same time, mm -hmm. you know. But not being cruel. They're, they're not right, being They're cruel. never cruel, and there's always a sense of forgiveness in the end. You know, in the end, there's always a sense of, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that, or maybe I shouldn't have done that. 
but um, you know, they do love each other. You know, you'll see him, you know, hug her, give her a kiss on the cheek, that sort of thing. So, you know, there is love there. It's just that it's ornery love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 it was well, now, the upper hand love. <laughs> so now what are you planning for the uh, 11th Fiona Quinn? What are your plans? Because you said you gave it, it gave a sort of a facelift on this book. I created so, new characters in this book. book uh, yeah. Of course, Rita, Rita Landry is a new character. Um, I haven't decided what I'm doing with Michelle yet. No, Michelle, no, Michelle Hayden, is Michelle is Nathan's sister. sister. Right. Yeah. And we met her, but I haven't decided what I'm doing with her yet, if I'm doing anything at all, and I don't feel I need to make that decision right now. I don't have mm -hmm. to make it. Um, I did bring in some new characters besides Rita, and it's kind of going to give um, the stories a, a little bit of a new flavor, and mm -hmm. um, gives me some more fodder to go in different directions with the characters and the story. Maybe lines. Fiona will start teaching fourth grade. Okay, you never know. Yeah, maybe you never know. <laughs> you never know. She'll she'll get that fourth grade position, you know. But um, yeah. So and you know we meet. Uh, there's I think there's three. Now um, I borrowed a character from the Owl's Nest and brought it yes. into this book. Yes, they do cross over. As a matter of yes. fact, you had Fiona in the first Owl's Nest right. as uh, one of the customers. As one of the customers in the. Uh, customers in the uh, couturier shop. She came yeah. in to have her wedding dress um, fitted. That's all she did. She didn't play an integral part in the storyline. Yeah, she was just there. So, um, and and uh, my character Alexa has a um, boyfriend named Detective Cliff Slater, mm -hmm. and Cliff Slater is kind of interesting because when they go to the 1950s and 60s, they also bump into his grandfather, Clifton Slater, who was a big time Pittsburgh detective. So she has met his grandfather, who is yeah. still alive. She's never met his grandfather in the 21st century. He's still alive. He's like 92 years old and he's in a nursing home. Yeah. She hasn't met him. We'll get around to doing yeah. But um, she, so he came into matrimony, mayhem, and murder because when everything went down, you know, Nathan was too close to the people, that, the, the girl who had been murdered. I mean, she was his wedding planner and she was dating his future brother in law. And so they had to bring in another detective. Well, Later was just sitting around not doing anything, so I grabbed hold of him and brought him over. And... <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, uh, you, you know, just grab a hold of him and bring him in. <laughs> just brought him right in and said, "Here you go, Cliff. You, we've got another uh, little role for you to play here." <laughs> and and he was more than willing to do it. You know, he, we had a lot of fun with him, and of course we have um, uh, Tavia Andrews, who is. Uh, Nathan's good friend in the um, in the police department, along with Wyatt Hayes, but we yeah. see that interaction between Tavia and the Cliff Slater, seeing that you know Nathan isn't the only police detective in the department that she helps with information and paperwork and whatnot. You know, we see her working with Cliff as as well. So. Um, you know, it's, it was fun bringing him over. It was a lot of fun bringing him over. And are you thinking of maybe having likewise over, have Nathan maybe go over to the owl's nest? To, you never know. You never you know. You never know. I, you know, you might, you might see Detective Nathan Landry in Bull Dog Dare. So hmm. he may, he may make an appearance there because he, you know, let's face it. This book is published. That means he's sitting around doing nothing. We got to make some use of him. <laughs> so he doesn't get lazy. He should be enjoying his honeymoon. That's what he should be doing. <laughs> That's right. He should be on his honeymoon. And here I am. Yeah, I, I, you never know. He may make an appearance. He may make a big appearance over there. 
So yeah. and sometimes it's fun to cross the characters over because the one character, Celia, Celia Ramsey, yeah, she was a transplant from first four series. Mm -hmm. She, yeah, you know, and she, she was in the first book. She also made an appearance. She in was Marvel in the second. No, she was in the third book. Um, to the breaking point. That's what she yeah, was. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, that was the first four series. She was in the third four, but then yeah. she appeared in the first book. Fiona's series. first yeah. book, right. But you introduced she was a ballerina. Yeah. yeah, you introduced her in the first, in the first four books. Right, because she was a professional ballerina. And then when we, whenever uh, I wrote Murder on Point, I needed a, a ballerina. And I thought, well, she's not doing anything. And I brought her over to Fiona. And she has made two appearances in the Fiona Quinn books. She was in uh, Murder on Point, and then she's in. she was in book five, Mambo and Murder, which was the ballroom dancing. She was in that book as well. So, yeah, I like, I like borrowing characters and being If you have already created them and if they're a good fit for, you know, and, and, and that's probably pretty unique in that because Celia was in a romantic suspense, which was kind of edgy. Very edgy. Then, yes, and the one she was in was very edgy. Yeah. Yeah. And now and you then, see her in the cozy mystery. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm And That's she was you know, a cozy character. She was she was a good character. Yeah, she she came came right in, and so did her husband Grant. He mm -hmm. he he we saw him backstage at the um ba at the ballet at the end of the book, he made an appearance with a, a dozen roses for her, you know, but that's all I did with him. You know, I didn't do anything he, more with him. He didn't have any lines. He didn't uh, this today at Authors on iTours. If you enjoyed our conversation with C.S. McDonald, then do be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to get notifications for our next Authors on iTours interview. Hope to see you next time. Happy reading.